Good morning from Panhandle Outdoors with Winston Chester. Panhandle Outdoors, your source for fishing, hunting, and information for folks who enjoy the great outdoors. Now sit back, relax. It's Panhandle Outdoors. Good morning, folks. Welcome to Panhandle Outdoors in Winston Chester. I'm glad to hear this morning. We've got a big show lined up. Let's start our weather brought to us by Haney Technical Center at the corner of Baldwin and Highway 77. Remember to check out all the programs they have there. It's going to be warmer today, up to 65 degrees, and a low is going to be down to 51. So uh, all the rain's out of here, it looks like. But the big thing to be on, on the weather is the water temperature. It has finally got into the 50 degrees. It is 59 degrees uh, this morning. So that is something we've talked about this winter. This is the first time this winter has gotten this low, 59 degrees. And that cold weather finally caught up with us and as far as the water temperature and, and the angle of the sun. So. We're going to uh, ha have some cool water temperature. River readings. Take a look at the river readings. The Appalachian Cold of Blountstown is still high, folks. I know a lot of deer hunters are hunting those islands. <laughs> I hear that all the time. All weekend I heard it. Uh, okay, it's going to be uh, it's right at 12 foot, and it looks like it's going to stay at 12 foot for the next couple of days. It may, towards Friday, it may start going down a little bit, but it, we've had just a lot of water here in the southeast. The Choctahatchee River at Caraville is reading a 6.4 this morning. And it's in pretty good shape. It's going to uh, pretty, pretty well level off around around six uh, for the rest of the week, and maybe Thursday. It's, it's just going to stay around six between six and seven. So uh, the shot has river is a little high, but it's going to be uh, not moving a whole lot. All right, now take a look at our uh, tie chart brought to us by Kent Forest Lawn Funeral Home and Cemetery. Their motto is "When Caring Counts." Have a low tide at 5:19, and today is the 13th of January. Uh, not very strong tide, just low at uh, 519 and high at 413 this afternoon. But if you look at this weekend's tides, they look like it's been in good shape. I know these winter tides, uh, you, they get low. I've noticed uh, when you get your boat out, and all the boat ramps that go by is really low. I live on the water myself and just get a little bit of a north wind. It just really pushes it out all along the base system. We've talked about that before. Marine forecast will be coming out of north at about 5 to 10. All right, let's take our break and we'll be right back. All right, welcome back. Let's start, start off this segment with a few pictures we got. Uh, they, they keep being sent in by you folks, and it is really neat to see all the things that happen here in the Panhandle on a regular basis. Even this cold weather we had last week, we still have things going on. For instance, this first picture here, bass fishing in 30-degree weather, and that's Andrew Adams, one of my former students, called a six-pounder. Good job, Andrew. All right, we're going to see some bucks now. We had the kids out this, that, this past week, and the weekend was a good weekend for, for hunting. This is Wesley uh, Tilgman, his Nancy, his mom Nancy, and dad Brad, his grandparents Carl and Nancy Andrews, and that's a nice buck there, Wesley. I know he's just a grinning. Now, this is one of Tom Gurley's photos. This, this man, oh, cold weather, even the gators snuggle up, Tom said. They, uh, Papa and Mama, that's a really good shot. That's out at St. Andrews State Park. Good job. All right, now, check this out. This is shotgun that's split. Now, it's not, that's not stick sticking up out of, that's a barrel that is split uh, in a couple of parts. Now, this, this happens on occasion. This can be very dangerous. Fortunately, no one was hurt. Heather Taylor sent this in. This barrel split, uh, <clears throat> they weren't sure what caused it. My guess is, you see there out there by that uh, marsh area? Chances are there's a, there was an obstruction, probably got a little bit of mud in that barrel, and it doesn't take just a little bit of a obstruction to really mess up a, uh, a shot, and that, that's what happened. And uh, it, it, it is, uh, they thought it might have been an old shell or something. Usually it's an obstruction, so you know that can happen, and it does on occasion, so always be careful. Make sure, it's happened to me before, my, my barrel's been obstructed, especially duck hunting, walking through the marsh area. Okay, nice buck here. This. Listen, this is Tom. This is a, this is not a Panhandle book. This is a, a one of the former students here. I, I, up in uh, he, he's got a land up there in Kentucky. This is Thomas Halls. Now, I, listen, I was supposed to be on this hunt. That's why I keep struggling around on it. I, he invited me to go way back in the summer. We've talked about it. I see him on a regular basis, and I'd planned on going. Uh, Thomas, uh, he ended up taking Andy Brimer. But I was welcome to go. I just, uh, with this cold weather, and in fact, it was nine degrees when he shot that buck last week. Uh, bow season, this is the end of the 
who run up there in Kentucky. That is a nice one, though. And uh, like I say, I was, it was a, that's a beautiful book. He told me that he has them on camera and all. He, he has a, just a little bit of family property up there, not a very big piece. And he hunts it every year and gets them a nice book. So I think I'm going to go next year. <laughs> I'm just going to wrap up and go. Uh, anyway. All right, uh, this is funny. I, I, every now and then, I hope you all appreciate it. How inter this is how parents, uh, when they were teenagers, uh, uh, you can't find your shoes when you need them, yet you can find a tiny bit of onion in your dinner. I know a lot of your parents have uh, had that frustration there. You, they want to eat it, got a little piece of onion in it. Next picture. Uh, this, is, this is really good here. I like, uh, this is bird hunting. It's Aaron York. Aaron's coached a couple places. He, uh, Last year, Franklin County, and then is also up at Bozeman one time. And uh, Aaron's a good hunter. Uh, Dad, Freddie York, they went quail, hunt, quail hunting. They got they put out 30 birds, and they they brought in 30. Good job on that, Aaron. Uh, next, uh, Seasons of Hope went over to Greenville, Alabama this past weekend. Michael Harris took his group up there. They got three nice does, and. Uh, and all those kids had an opportunity to get out there in the woods and do some good dog hunting, and I know they had a great time. I just couldn't make it, but uh, they, they had a good time. They're still fishing in cold weather. Old Remington Stotler got him some flounder and a sheephead. That's a good trip right there. Remington's a good fisherman. I, I have his picture on there a lot. Good job. Now, this is, <laughs> this is relaxing. This is Junior Kelly. <laughs> his wife Pam took this picture. That's the one thing about having a comfortable tree stand and a little bit of a heat in there. You can get very comfortable. I don't think he got a, a buck that. That was this past weekend. That was Sunday afternoon, I think. Uh, all right, Junior. Now, listen, we don't see this picture very often. This is up here at Marson Springs. This is Tyler Meadows fishing out of his kayak, kayak and got a pickerel. Uh, good job there. That You just don't see these very often. Nice, nice fish there. And this is what he caught it on. He caught it on a, a storm bait. That's called a wild-eyed shad storm bait. Okay? So we show you where he caught it, when he caught it, and what he caught it with. Now, right, uh, a couple more pictures. This hog. He's hog. This is uh, Mark and Kim Lane, and that's Carl Andrews on the right there. And they had nine hogs in a the trap. They let three of them go. They hunt down there around Wee Wall and all. Okay? Now, this next one, I'm going to read. Okay, all this. Gail stuck this one in here. Last week it was raining, and Mason, they live around the corner up there, and he came down to the house, and I was comfortable around the fire, and he said, Granddad, I'm going to go fishing, so what am I, what are you going to say? So I, I, we went out in the dog, we caught a couple of little trout and all, but uh, we, uh, we had a good time. The rain was about stopped by then, but uh, you, just can't, you just can't turn down a request from your grandson to go fishing. All right. Uh, this picture here, this is a good picture. I wanna, I'm going to read an email uh, along this picture. There are two pictures here. This sent to us by Monica Smith. He said, I'm, uh, hey, Winston, I'm sending this picture of the kids for two reasons. First of all, it was nine-year-old Jackson Brown's first buck that he killed with his 20-gauge, and man, was that buck running. It was the first time he shot at a deer that the dogs were running, and he emptied his gun on it. I got the picture on December 20, uh, I'm sorry, December 31st. The kids from left to right, DJ Jackson, grandson of Rojo and Janet Jackson, Sierra and Tristan Petty, grandson of Harold and Linda Petty. They watch your show every morning. And Jackson Brown, grandson of Buddy Brown. All of these kids regularly hunt with our part at Eglin Air Force Base. It is a tough place to kill a deer, much less one that is running from a pack of dogs. And I agree, I've, I've hunted that area before. It's rough terrain. Okay, now, I'm going to show you another picture. All right, here. All right. Now, I'm going to finish up the email, okay? DJ, on the left, was in a terrible automobile accident on January the 6th that took the life of his grandmother, Janet Jackson. DJ is in Sacred Heart in Pensacola, still in critical condition, and has undergone several surgeries and is in, a, is in an induced coma. I ask that you put him on your prayer list as his life will never be the same, even if he survives. He was raised by his grandmother, Janet, and he was her world. Please remind everyone that life is precious. Like things and love people as Janet did. Do things today that cause other people to remember you for the good memories they have of and with you. 
and uh, please enter us and thank you Monica Smith and what a what a special email that is and we certainly need to uh, put young DJ in our, on our prayer list and all and uh, and I like what she said at the end uh, you like things and you love people what a great great philosophy there so I uh, thank you for sending that in and we'll let's go ahead and uh, take this and we'll keep us posted too on him uh, let's take this break and we'll be right back <laughs> Hi, welcome back. Get some names in, so we're going to add these real quick. Dave Borges. Okay. Greg Frady, Alford up there, up the road here. Milton Prescott, Gra uh, Graceville. Milton, watch the show every morning. Mayor Prescott, Graceville. We run out of fishing tour cards. I'm on my Carl Key, West End of Panama City Beach. Barb Key, Saint West End of Panama City Beach. This is Tom Adam, the Funiac. We've got them all over the place. Joyce Adam DeFuniac, Taylor, Taylor Tyson DeFuniac Springs, that Tyson family been up there, Judy Tyson Bonifay, Hiram Tyson Bonifay, good family up there, Mary Lou Scott Sneeds, Thomas K. Leo, Phillips Inlet, Thomas K. Leo, Dennis Scott Sneeds, Pam Hutton, Mike Hutton, I guess they're local. Cindy Daniels, is it not? Bill Barlow, Bill local. Let's look at uh, Dion Khalil, Phillips Inlet. Buddy Brown, up there in Paxton, I believe. Monica Smith, we just read her email. Nancy Barker, the Funac Springs. William Barker, the Funac Springs. Mary Cruz, Westfield. Versi Cruz, Westfield, they've been with us since day one. Mike Graziosa from Compass Lake. And Rich Frady from Alford. Okay, so we got that in there. Now let's take a look. Let's see. Next thing on here, I got an email from Doug Lurie, and this is this is interesting. I, as a viewer, I think you would enjoy this. He he, he titled it, "Am I an enduring dummy or an endearing sportsman?" I'm gonna read you a little, one little short paragraph. A large, magnificent buck lives on my farm, and I have hunted him for several weeks. I had, I had seen him four times, but could not get a clear shot until yesterday when I saw him for the fifth time. He came out of the fog at 7.10 a.m. and quartered to my left. When he went through a thick area, I got my gun up and waited for him to cross an open lane 60 yards from me. Most of the time you get that two to five seconds to decide on a shot, and that's about true, the statistics. This time I had at least 30 seconds to think about it. Things were going through my head about how big he would be next year if I let him go and all the breeding he could do and spread good genetics around the farm. Does a farmer take the best bull and make stakes of him? Bear in mind that I have gotten up before 4 a.m. 23 times this hunting season to hunt this buck. What do I do? I let him go. Doug. <laughs> and if it's on your own farm and all that, that's not a bad decision. I understand. I, I, I told him back, uh, you know, he's right there. And that's, that's that quality of buck management. And hopefully he'll survive. And, and there'll be many more bucks coming from there. I just thought that was uh, that was interesting. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. And I, I know the feeling. So good, good job on that. And uh, you'll be rewarded, I think, with some... Uh, Really good book line of books right there. That genetic is, is important. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, one thing up, uh, uh, switching channels now. My don't don't you switch channels? I'm just switching channels on the show. Uh, the my students, uh, I had them do the New Year's resolution, and I wanted to give you some of the highlights. I took about the top seven ones. They're no in no particular order, and just wrote them on the board for my five classes of seniors. That's about 200 something kids. And uh, at first they were a little reluctant, but once we started rolling, they were spitting them out right and left. And uh, these were the most mentioned in my five classes. And I, this is my handwriting on the board, so bear with me. I don't know how they can read it. I just can't. Seniors' top resolutions. Number one, and that's not, like I said, no particular order, but a lot of them talked about saving money this year, which I said for 18-year-olds to be thinking of that, I'm, I'm impressed because that, that's hard for 18-year-olds to do it. Number two, spend more time with my family. And we talk about this a lot, about really this is their last year as a family unit as they know it. And, and uh, they're going to be going off to school and service and different things, getting jobs. And, and, they, and they're beginning to realize this, especially at uh, this time of year. Number three, quit 
procrastinating, and they we all do that. And, and they're bad, bad about uh, when the paper due on next Wednesday, they're going to do it on Tuesday. And we, we talk a lot about that, too. So that, that's good for all of us. Number four, better grades. I think that's been their resolution since about the sixth grade, but they, everybody wants to make better grades. Number five is impressive. In every class I had, uh, a few of the kids said they just want to have a, basically a closer walk with God and, and just do do good things and all. Number six is always strong, eat healthier. And they they mean well, but they, it's hard for teenagers to uh, to eat healthy when they only go so much. But they do think about it. And the last one, number seven, be a better friend. And I was I was impressed on, on, on being a better friend because so many of them, uh, uh, they get in little cliques and all, and, and they get so involved with with uh, their lives and all, they, they forget about the importance of friendship, and they, they are thinking about it. So I was, I'm really pleased to see that. And that might be some 18-year-old resolutions, but that's not bad resolutions for all of us. Uh, those are really good. All right, last thing here, we talked about a blue crab closure. Uh, I know some of you, we had, we caught some blue crabs off the dock the other day, and we went ahead and, uh, and of course, let them go. We, uh, we don't really eat a lot of them, but they're fun. The, the kids have got to catch them with a net. But now it's closed on this map right here. This is part of the panhandle. Uh, this area right here, the green from January the 5th through 14th. So it's about to open back up, but uh, people are asking about the location. So anyway, it's about open by the time you uh, uh, get all this done and all. So, all right, let's go ahead and uh, get ready for our final break, and we'll be right back. All right, welcome back. Let's take a look at our fishing game forecast today, brought to us by Mark Coward, Edgewater Beach Realty. Mark's number is 832-6000. And boy, they, he and Michael have really been fishing hard lately. Now, this morning's time, we're looking at 5.42 to 7.42. A good block of time this morning. It could be a good morning to get out. And this evening, 6.05 to 8.05. So that, that's a good situation there. Now, I've got a, I just got a lot of emails on today's show. I appreciate uh, all the emails. One of them uh, was, uh, hey, glad to see the water temperature coming out. This is from Captain Bill Barlow. Uh, squid. He, he's talking about squid. And we mentioned this the other day. Squid have started showing up, but not in big numbers yet. Uh, we've had, I've had one or two pictures of squid, and they, this time of year now, they're starting to show up. So we, and that's easy fishing. You can go down to the city marina, right down there in one of the best places to go, or either in St. Andrew, off the marina wall there. Uh, don't cost anything, just uh, do it, of course, at nighttime and all. We've had people here talking about it. Uh, so that was from Bill. Thank you for letting them know the squid are in, okay? Uh, this right here. From Taylor Stanford, he said, hey, Coach, I wanted to uh, add my wife and I to drawings, which we just did, of uh, Brooke and Taylor Stanford and Lynn Haven. I also uh, want to know about that deer hunting book you mentioned a few weeks ago on the show. What's the uh, name of it and the author? I can't seem to find it. I'm just going to hold it up right here. This is right here, Whitetail Strategies by Dr. Robert Shepard. They have these at C&G, and like I say, I've, I've mentioned it before here several times, and and Ronnie's going to be on the show tomorrow, and, and Ronnie says the same thing I say. This is the best book uh, we've ever read on deer hunting because it's, it's here in the southeast, up in Alabama, and an uh, excellent book. So that's it right there, Taylor. Glad you asked right there. Now I have another question from another viewer. This is from Phil Hester. Phil's retired from FWC, entering his name and all. But he had a good question. Does anyone sell uh, crap emitters uh, closer to Lynn Haven than the places over on Highway 22. I'm not sure of that. If y'all, if y'all know of any place that does sell these uh, minnows, let us know, and I'll pass it on to to Phil, and so he'll have an opportunity to to take advantage of, of those, you know, live bait this time of year, and and is excellent fishing. Okay. Now this this is from the FWC, and we talk about we don't have supposedly any panthers, any Florida panthers up here, but we have uh, sightings all over the state. Seems like and up into Georgia. But one of them got run over the other day. I'm going to read you this. This is a really neat story. Uh, today, the FWC re released a rehabilitated Florida panther at the Kissimmee Reserve down in Okeechobee. Uh, in April of 2014, a vehicle struck the two-year-old male panther as it was crossing a road just east of Fort Meade there in Polk County. After several hours of searching by the Polk County Sheriff's Office and the biologists. They, they looked for this. They knew it had been hit, and but they couldn't find him. But finally, uh, they found the injured panther in a nearby woods where it had crawled under a fallen tree. And that's where a lot of times wounded animals will go for protection. They'll get up under something. And FWC veterinarian sedated and stabilized the cat and then transported to the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Florida for treatment. 
Their team of veterinarians operated. They implanted two stabilizing plates to repair the cat's broken left femur. Later, they performed a second surgery to, in, to insert a third plate. After the surgeries were completed, FWC took the sap to a, a conservation center near Yulee, where it could be where it could cover. So they just released it. It was hit in April, but what they uh, last year they they did the team did a similar surgery on the panther that was later successfully released, and we are pleased. And a quote from them: We are pleased the panther are now healthy and ready to be back to the wild. But they they attribute, and this is where we come in here. They attribute this able, the ability to save these panthers to the quick response of the public. In other words, the person that hit this panther immediately got on the phone, on the cell phone, and called in FWC and told them what had happened because they realized, you know, that you know these are protected species and they're able to get out there. If they'd waited a day or two, uh, they never would have. Uh, the panther may not probably would not, uh, you know, with a broken leg, they they can't. Uh, get any food and all, so he, he would have died. So that's really uh, complimentary to the viewing public and all, and it's, uh, it's glad to see that. So anytime you get an opportunity like that to, to uh, call them and all, they, they respond pretty fast and all, so good job. Now, on tomorrow's show, like I say, Ronnie is going to be here later on in the week. We'll have uh, Students of the Month and have some, uh, hope you enjoyed yesterday's video on witness deer hunt up there in, in uh, Illinois. Yeah, I got tickled at because there were like five different parties up there, and she and there were five five grown grown people hunting, you know, in different places. And uh, she, as a little thirteen year old girl, was the only one to, to get a buck on that trip. And, I, and she was tickled, and they were tickled for her. It was, and they had a really good time. And I, so cast and call comes on every Sunday morning at six thirty, and I don't. You, that's the first one I've ever shown on our Panhandle Outdoor Show. And I, on occasion, I may do that, but that was really. Really good stuff and a real quality uh, uh, editing and video and all. So uh, I thought you'd enjoy it. Some of y'all didn't get a chance to see it during the Christmas holiday. So anyway, we're going to start wrapping things up. I have a couple more things and I have some more pictures to show you tomorrow, some more quail hunts and all. But we're going to wrap it up. And as always, we talk to you about, you know, always doing good things for other people. And, and we remember what she said, like things and love people. I, I like that one a lot. All right, let's go ahead and wrap it up. You do something good and have a great day. And God bless. Thanks for joining us for Panhandle Outdoors with Winston Chester. Panhandle Outdoors features hunting, fishing, and other activities and information to help you enjoy the great outdoors. Join us next time for Panhandle Outdoors.